Hey everyone, my name is Chris and I teach the only online ESL course for learning about politics, history, economics, and other social sciences. If you want to learn more about the various courses I teach on those subjects, you can email me at the address in the description and we'll learn together. This video is about nationalism. Nationalism is basically the belief that the people of the world are divided into distinct groups called nations. Nations are like countries. They're supposed to be historical, cultural groups. And in fact, if you look at the word nation, it's actually very similar to the Latin word for being born. So the idea of the nation is it's a community you're born into. Not all nations have a state, so they don't all have their own countries, like Kurdish people, uh, and not all of them agree with the states that rule them. Some countries have several nations ruled by one state, and where there are no states, there's no nationalism. By the way, if you don't know what the state is, please see my video on that subject first. Nationalists think each nation should have its own state. They get outraged when their rulers are from a different nation. I get outraged by all rulers, wherever they're from, but then I'm not a nationalist. Like all the topics you learn in my courses, uh, the subject of nationalism has a canon of books you can read on the subject, and we're going to dip into that canon today. Some people tell me that nationalism does not have to mean violence. It could be a productive thing. Well, it does mean excluding people from the nation or restricting their freedom to move in and out of the land the nation says is theirs, and sometimes using violence on them to keep them outside. These are the nationalists' double standards. One for our people, from our nation, and a different one for outsiders. Let's look at a line from Ernest Gellner's Nations and Nationalism. It may be that, as Immanuel Kant believed, partiality, the tendency to make exceptions on one's own behalf or one's own case, is the central human weakness from which all others flow and that it infects national sentiment as it does all else. If we're told all our lives this is our nation, we tend to be much more forgiving of what people from our nation do. We tend to see the members of our nation more as individuals. Other nations, especially enemies, we don't forgive and we don't see them as individuals. When I lived in China, I found almost everyone I met hated Japan as a nation because of what it had done to China as a nation during World War II. When I asked one guy why they cared so much about Japan, which hasn't done anything to Chinese people since 1945, but don't care about the people who committed violence during the Cultural Revolution or the massacre in Tiananmen Square more recently, he told me, you can forgive people of your nation in the same way you forgive your family. So he hated this whole other nation for things they did that that were worse, I'm sure, but not so different from what people from his nation had done. And he didn't see a problem with that. That's partiality. That's a double standard. When looking at history, Gellner and the next person we're going to look at, Benedict Anderson, both consider literacy central to the development of nationalism. 
Anderson's book is called Imagined Communities. Look near the top, the first paragraph indent there. It is imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. Think of communion here as community or feeling like a community, something like that. So Anderson calls nations imagined communities because we think of them as groups we belong to and groups we have things in common with and groups with the same interests as us, but because of how big they are, we can only imagine that, that we're really one cohesive group. And by imagining that we're this cohesive group called a nation, we create the nation. Anderson's main point in this book is that nations, as we know them, were created when books and newspapers began to be made in the national language of European states. Before these books came along, there were no national languages. States just ruled lots of different people in the territory they had conquered. Those people would not have thought of themselves as German, French, or Italian like they do today. But when printing came out in Europe, and when people wa started wanting to make money by printing things, what Anderson calls print capitalism, they helped shape people's thinking. When everyone in the, in the nation reads the same or a similar newspaper every morning, they might feel a common bond. In the early 1500s, publishers printed in Latin, but there weren't enough Latin speakers in Europe to make much in the way of profit. So they started printing in local languages, or uh, vernaculars, the word the book tends to use. Nothing served to assemble related vernaculars more than capitalism which, within the limits imposed by grammars and syntaxes, created mechanically reproduced print languages capable of dissemination through the market. Dissemination means spreading, by the way. He's saying that it was capitalism, choices by publishers trying to earn money, that simplified these local languages in order to sell books. And rulers use writing even today to create and recreate the idea of the nation. On the next page, he says, you can see in the middle here, today, the Thai government actively discourages attempts by foreign missionaries to provide its hill tribe minorities with their own transcription systems and to develop publications in their own languages. The same government is largely indifferent to what these minorities speak. Transcription is writing, by the way, so the government of Thailand doesn't want the hill tribes of Thailand to have their own written language, because then they might stop reading Thai and consider themselves separate nations. And no state wants that. Most nationalists seem to think the bond among people that we call a nation is primordial. Primordial means it has existed since the beginning of time, or at least for centuries. But that isn't a very accurate way to understand them. Take a look at Eric Hobsbawm's book, Nations and Nationalism Since 1780. 
Like most serious students, I do not regard the nation as a primary or as an unchanging social entity. It belongs exclusively to a particular and historically recent period. It is a social entity only insofar as it relates to a certain kind of modern territorial state, the nation-state. And it is pointless to discuss nation to discuss nation and nationality, except insofar as both relate to it. Moreover, with Gellner, I would stress the element of artifact, invention, and social engineering, which enters into the making of nations. Uh, by the way, with long passages like that, with any words that you have you have trouble with, it's good to read them more than once to really understand them, and you might want to do that now. What Eric Hobsbawm is saying here is the nation only exists in relation to the nation-state, and the nation-state is quite a new invention. Nations were invented, and recently. I would add that even though they weren't necessarily inventions of the state or the ruling class, the people in power use nationalism to keep themselves in power and sell their policies to their people. In that way, nationalism has become one of the most powerful ideas of the past 200 years. My students often ask me, what is the difference between nationalism and patriotism? My answer is, patriotism is nationalism for people who don't like the word nationalism. When we think of nationalism, a lot of people think of prejudice and exclusion, like racism, borders, and going to war in the name of your country. And they're right. Those are the most obvious effects of nationalism. Well, most people who call themselves patriots believe in all of the same things. Not all of them hate the national enemies they're given to hate, but when there's a war or some other crisis, they usually line up behind the state, because they believe the state represents or should represent the nation. To me, patriotism is nationalism with a smiling face. Maybe I'm wrong, but the more people claim to love their country, the easier it is to trick them into defending it. Let's review the vocabulary. We mentioned First, we mentioned the word canon. Canon is all the most important books on a certain topic, what, what people consider the most important books. We use dip into. We're going to dip into some of these books. We just read a little bit. It's not necessarily read. It could be try of some other way. Uh, we learned about double standards. Um, just having one standard or rule for one group, usually for my group, but a different rule for another group. Literacy uh, means just being able to read, like the word literature, meaning books. Um, it usually means a whole society, a whole country. What are the literacy rates in this country? Uh, the word cohesive is about groups, talking about how groups work together as groups. If it's a really good team that works well together, it's a very cohesive group. A bond is just a connection. Uh, we might feel a bond with other people from our nation, but it might just be an artificial bond. The word vernacular, not a very common word. Uh, but it's certainly very common in Benedict Anderson's work. Uh, vernacular just means a local language. Primordial, existing from since the beginning of time. Um, 
primordial nationalism is one very common form of nationalism. And finally, the word prejudice, which is really just disliking people uh, because of some group they belong to, disliking people before you know them, hence the pre part of prejudice. I've studied this subject for a while, and all it's really made me do is reject all nationalism. I want us to think of ourselves as a global community of humans, not exclusive groups divided by lines on the map who might have to fight each other if our masters tell us to. That's all. Thanks, everyone. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment if you have any questions or disagree with anything, and share this video to any spaces where people are learning English. See you next week.